in short, uh, I would summarize, uh, I have grave doubts on the assumed speeds that the handsome team has uh, assumed okay, let's in their... Yeah. Well, if I could start this, <coughs> because I think contexts are important, and then John, I know, is anxious to get at some of the other questions. Um, you know, it, it, it's important to, to, to do as the last parts of your questions have done, which is to look squarely at 1992 questions. Because if you compare from today, just looking out your window, it's not a very good comparison, and it's not a very good judgment that could be made. <coughs> Comparing 2,400 buses now versus our description of 2,700 buses is not a correct comparison. You know the buses that you now have, and we're telling you the buses of 1992 that are depicted in this model are 94 passenger modern air-conditioned buses with the kind of attributes that buses in 1992 will have, certainly in terms of their ability to speed, their better ability to brake, or whatever else it may be. To speak of trying express routes now, when in fact you're not doing the express routes on freeways, is not to say that the express system that we're describing for 1992 is tried. So I really just suggest that you know, we, we always see the image in front of us of what we have. Unfortunately, analytically, we're talking about numbers and actions and things out in 1992. And I think the questions that you're, these subordinate questions you've asked are essentially addressed to that. And that's what we, in fact, have been analyzing and are better able to respond. The other comparisons are not basically valid. We're talking about a dynamically changed, a radically changed bus system from what is existing today. I just like Excuse me. Yeah. I, I, I don't see the difference. Uh, hmm. I think Mabotan said we, we have a system at the moment. You are saying let's have a high performance uh, bus service. Yes. And you are saying that between now and 1992, things will change. What yes. will change? Because I, as I understand it, it takes a lead time of five, maybe more years to build an expressway or arterial road yes. system. And it's 10 years from now. We've got to know what they are now no, for I 1992. Think, I think that's a good question, Mr. Wong. And we're saying, as we understand the building of the expressways, you will be essentially on stream with your expressways about 1986, right? So they will be available and they will have been used and they will be there will be various measures to restrain or use them and so on by 1992, which is when we put these numbers of vehicles on them. When we're talking about uh, uh, other aspects of it, there, there are those changes. There are the potential of, of measures to control the speeds of vehicles or the numbers that go on them. You're going to have to make those decisions regardless. True. This is the what. Yes. This is your, your luxury is that you give us options. Our yes, difficulty is that we have to make those decisions. And therefore, uh, Milton will certainly not be happy if uh, all the motorists in Singapore were denied the expressway or to pay a yes. toll on it right. to get on the ramp or whatever. Exactly. But, but the point I'm trying to make is that because the highways are going to be ready, expressways are going to be ready by 1986, we've got to know what they are now for 1992. But Joseph says it, it just can't be done. Is it what you're saying, Joseph? I think what I have said was uh, we will get this network of expressways by 1992 because it has been forecasted. We right. require but such a network. Can you get such speed, sir? Yeah, this is where I express my doubts. The speeds on the network of expressways shown in red on the plan there. To get the whole network ready, available for use, is one thing. To be able to have the buses modern as they are, to attain those speeds during a peak hour condition, I think is something else. The speed issue, again, we're at, at the nub of it again. I think there are at least a couple observations on that. One of them is that we've stressed the importance of allocating space appropriately as among the various users. Uh, and this is an extensive expressway network in 1992. Uh, and uh, uh, we believe that there is space for buses on it. Uh, we believe that, the, that the, there is space at 60 kilometers per hour, as we suggest. And in our sensitivity analysis, we, if, if Mr. Yi is right, we'll give him 45 kilometers per hour. 
Uh, but the point is that, that, that these roads are for the use of all the citizens uh, and not just for the use of automobiles and trucks. And so it is a question of allocation as well as a question of design. If, if the roads are improperly designed so that they cannot maintain those kinds of speeds, that's an important issue and not to be taken into account. The impressions we've received, the briefings we've received on the expressway uh, system indicates that it's a very generous one given the projected growth of traffic uh, between now and 1992. But that's a very, very important uh, and serious issue. On the question of the feeders, <coughs> Uh, Maybe, John, yeah. I think uh, at this point, I would like to see so far what kind of image do you think, uh, Tensor, you see, and maybe later I'll move on to ask Milton to, to see what kind of uh, question you may ask from a motorist point of view. Well, in a sense, what I'm going to say also affects Milton because I'm looking at it from the viewpoint of road users. I agree that, you know, we are designing so far in, with things like the ALS, a scheme where we sort of tell people that there are priorities. Now, as I understand it, the express bus system depends on our telling people even more that that priorities have to be pushed even further. In other words, the pedestrian, the bus commuter comes first. The truck driver and perhaps, well, the vehicle owner, the car driver, he'll have to wait a while. Now, yeah, the point that I'm asking here is then, under those circumstances, to what extent can the car driver, the non-bus commuter, bear the cost? Because the cost will be very, very high. They are going to get higher. Okay, we are the only country in the world that has experimented with a system that has gone as far as we have gone. But that this is linked back with the issue of votes and costs. Because if cost gets very high for the car driver, what is the impact? What is the final impact on what he will do with his feet? Will he decide to keep himself in the car or will he switch to a bus? In fact, if I push Mr. Henson's point to the end, right through to the end, it seems almost logical to say, look, let's go to the extreme end and forget about car driving. Let's tell everybody, unless it's really essential, don't get on a car, not at peak periods anyway. And let's just concentrate on taking buses. Now, the point about that is if you draw the issue <coughs> to the end, then it's going to hurt. At some point, something gives. When you look at the MRT rail system, what you, look, what you buy with that, the thing which I found striking, and I, I don't have these data handy, they, they're really in the uh, LUTPR and Phase Two report, is that what you really buy with the limited rail system is additional capacity for cars. Uh, the, uh, the way to think about it is that, uh, you take Robinson Road, the way to think about it is what you do is you add a lane of vehicle traffic, later automobiles, in each direction on Robinson Road. That's the corridor that the uh, backbone system goes down. Uh, and the question is, what is that worth? Uh, how much do you lose in terms of diversion? Uh, how much uh, is the cost of that extra capacity? And is there some additional or better way to provide that capacity? Our feeling is that you don't pay, you don't lose very much by giving more road space to buses. We're talking about uh, any place from one to two lanes in each direction, and that you would pay an exorbitant price uh, to add to capacity of the central area through the rail MRT. Our sense is that the amount of central area capacity, both road and rail, is just enormous and increasing very, very rapidly. But this think, argument yeah. clearly leaves out <coughs> the concern for the public transport traveler who, with a rail system, would get a better public transport system. He'd have a more convenient system, he'd have more convenient riding, he'd have uh, faster, smoother riding, he would have a much more opportunity to walk from his home to a reliable system that runs very frequently at two and a half minutes as the trains are scheduled during the peak, and would get to is close enough within his destination that he can walk from there to his destination. So he has no worries about getting to work or getting back home because the system does operate on its own right away. It is not subject to any kind of traffic conditions. It's not subject of uh, somewhere a traffic light breaking down and you have a two hour jam like we had the other day. Uh, and these things I think are important too because as you, as you go on, as you have a population that 
acquires higher skills, higher income levels, I believe they are entitled to expect perhaps something more from their public transport system than what they have today. I and and would we uh, check that where that we Newton have a word because... Thank yeah. you, Mr. Kane, for saying that uh, the roads are for all of us. I, reading through your report, I thought the roads were only for the buses. <laughs> um, then, sir, also I must thank you for putting the motorist's point of view. As I said many times, the Singaporeans' love affair with a car can never be broken. It's the young man's joy and the old man's darling. <laughs> Looking at your proposal of fast express bus, I would go with it if we had all this expressway existing. But if we have all this expressway existing, then surely the car can go on it. We can come into the central area as easily. And if you can build a little more car park for us, we can park our cars and we can come in with our buses. But as Bruno has stated, that with the population growth, we expect more vehicles. And of course, if we have this, then I feel that the MRT is the answer. I think many of these points are well taken. We're not saying that MRTs are not convenient, useful additions to the capacity. Among the alternatives we've set up here, we have in fact indicated the various alternatives. We have done a comparative cost evaluation. If you have the money here in Singapore, you can start building an MRT tomorrow. That isn't the basic question. We weren't asked whether you should. We were asked whether you needed to, whether there are alternatives, where are there less expensive ways to do it, and where, in fact, you can do it in a conceivable way. Now, let's get to the issue of the automobile. We stated, and we've stated tonight again, that if you apply what we consider, and you clearly, apparently consider, to be equitable principles of use of urban resources for the welfare of people, you are going to make various decisions about who shall have a share of those resources. And that goes for your road space as well. Now, if you apply those principles, you will clearly apply those principles, and I'm not trying to leave out trucks, but I'm trying to keep the problem a little more simple so we don't start with this slide rule business. You basically have a truck, a, a bus that has something on the order of 50, maybe 95 passengers going on that space, and you have an automobile that may even have five passengers going on space as well, and they use relatively different space to park in the community as well. Now, if you apply the principle, at least insofar as people are concerned, that it's people and not vehicles that have the access or have the rights or who pay the taxes and what have you, fundamentally you will come up with a reasonable allocation of this road space for those purposes. We do consider that having invested in these great freeways, and you've made a, you're making a very substantial investment, you ought to use them and get the real value out of them. And that's not to go the speed you go on arterials, but in fact to go faster, to give better access to automobiles and to buses to the central area and everywhere else that they can reach. Okay, I do not point. like, Mr. Toe, to be pushed to an extreme because this is where we get these doomsday scenarios that force us into decisions that sometimes aren't very wise. There is not that type of problem here. We're not running out of space. Your population is not growing that fast. And your population is going to taper off at a reasonable point as well. And there is a limit. I think it's very difficult maybe tonight to uh, come to resolution on this. I would like to ask Bill, maybe from the architectural environmental angle, you have some comments? Thank you. The bus system that the Hansen team proposes is not as clear. It would perhaps have congestion at the peak hours. It would re require large bus depots in the city area to low people and it would perhaps less convenient during peak hours. And my question is that whether one could consider the slightly more luxurious and therefore comfortable system, bearing in mind the environmental impact of the 
elevated railway coming all the way from um, Changi or possibly just from Badok over to Jurong where you have the rail in front of the flats over the existing roads as compared to buses which are less um, protruding into the environment uh, which are perhaps easier to overcome uh, is pollution problems uh, which are perhaps less uh, uh, difficult to handle in terms of its better flexibility. I'd like to teams to comment um, on the environmental impact of their systems. Maybe we start with uh, certainly to to add one thing to what Bill has said. The the combination system Bill does include express bus service on the expressways in the appropriate corridors in addition to the MRT. The the uh, matter of the detailed examination of environmental uh, amenities as affected by one all bus system and the bus rail system were not measured, you might say, in explicit terms during the course of the evaluation, but uh, judgmental values were placed under this on the basis of experience elsewhere. And certainly the uh, air pollution would be one major concern in the heavy corridors with uh, when you go to such things as the dual uh, bus lanes and the uh, stops even at 30 kilometers between stops if it could be attained. Uh, but the stopping and starting the additional exhaust and the uh, various elements put into the atmosphere uh, as compared with a bus rail system. Certainly I think that the air pollution be lessened. Noise pollution would also, in our view, be lessened, especially in the congested central area where the facility is underground and is taken away from the, uh, the, the, the uh, DBA levels are certainly lessened by having it in that location. Can they? Well, I think, I think my response, Bill, is, is relatively simple, and that is that obviously these factors can be taken into account and there are pluses and minuses. The fact that a, an MRT system, in fact, is elevated or at grade uh, for a long, long period of time, sometimes in very sensitive areas, sometimes in less sensitive areas. The fact that if you, in fact, if you put a lot of passengers underground in an MRT system, you have more automobiles out on the road, and they are not necessarily pollutionless or without visual intrusion or without noise. So you're going to have certain levels, and the trade-offs here are there. Now, when you get down to hard cases, there should be, obviously, an evaluation, to a certain extent quantitative and obviously to a considerable extent subjective and judgmental and professional judgments and what have you, as you've described. And that's standard to these kinds of detailed choices. Now, we have clearly not made that. We did feel that, in fact, the larger amount of elevation on one of the alternative or MRT approaches ought to be examined further. We asked for Professor McHugh, one of your colleagues from the, the Dean of the School of Design at Harvard, to come over and give a view as to what possible alignment and what possible aspects of this may be. That was a judgment call. And he said, I see some very positive urban development elements here with potentially offsetting features to to uh, visual pollution, what have you. No I question, these are very <clears throat> important, but there are pluses and minuses, and you've got to work it out in each particular case. I think uh, Nanjiang has a question. Yeah. True to the uh, penny-pinching image of those in my profession, the uh, all-bus system obviously uh, strikes as a very sympathetic chord in terms of uh, financing costs and monetary uh, requirements. And the heavy mass rapid transit system that goes totally underground will obviously send cold shudders down uh, our spines. If we think in terms of uh, a four billion dollar cost on December '79 prices, and I've heard the figure of uh, seven to eight billion dollars in 1982 current 80, prices, yeah. at current prices, and assuming you use a debt service cost of, say, 8%, or capital cost of 8%, that's um, <clears throat> $560 million uh, 
right off the bat, between 560 to 640 million dollars per annum. Uh, that obviously is a very high price for us to pay for, uh, I believe, 25 percent of the commuting traffic, and for the kind of uh, rights that uh, we talk about, Milton and, and, and Tiensa. So, I think we we are really essentially faced with this choice. Again, uh, on the one hand, I think uh, Botan's uh, SBS can take care of its own capital requirements, whether you buy double-deckers or articulated buses mm. or whatever you call them. Uh, somehow the SBS is able to, to finance its own requirements because the unit costs are much less, forgetting the fact that uh, for a moment that That's right. the, the roads are, the cost are the a very roads. major yeah. cost. So now if we sort of match the, the total under, underground versus the roads, I think it's still the expressway. I still think that it's still a very high cost. Mm. What I would like to, to hear from, from you, Bud, is in your experience, and I believe you, you all have experiences in, in Washington, in San Francisco, as to how the, the financing or the servicing of capital costs in these areas have been, and uh, how would you have some ideas and insights on how we could do it, other than the fact that the, 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 the government dishes out the whole $4 billion or $7 billion and say, here, but have fun. Yeah. Well, uh, Long John, the, the, the figure of $4 billion, uh, I think I heard for the first time after I arrived uh, in Singapore this trip, uh, similarly, seven to eight billion was the first time I had heard it when I was here this time. The uh, the capital cost estimate of the phase three study, I believe, in this report is about two point uh, nine uh, billion. Current cost. Uh, Current day prices. Uh, this three is two, isn't it? No, it's, it's three mm -hmm. two. They, that's for that's the for this system here. That's for this system here, not for the extensions. The extensions were also studied in uh, phase three. Yeah, three but it was also indicated th uh, in, a, in the analysis we did on the basis of the cost of 75 that if a capital contribution was made by the government in the order of $45 million. Million. $45 million. $45 million. $45 million as a cash contribution. Say if an authority was set up, a provisional authority, an authority, and a cash contribution of $45 million was made, then with a fair structure that gave about the equal fare from MRT as to buses, the system would pay off its capital debt and would pay its operating and maintenance cost. Now that was the, the, the figures that I have heard this time. When you go up to seven to eight billion dollars, it was mentioned by one officer of government of a cash contribution of $700 million as one contribution. That man related that to the annual PWD uh, budget for roads in the order of about a third of that each year. So that's the kind of contributions. Now these were the figures that were thrown out. Now if you go back to the United States situation, Washington and San Francisco and others, as certainly uh, in addition to Bruno, uh, Ken and John are well aware of, we have a program in our federal government, the Urban Mass Transportation Administration, of the capitalization and operating and maintenance contributions in the order of 80 percent. Now, that, I don't believe, was in existence at the time of the San Francisco. Yes. Uh, totally it was, but maybe... No, it, it came in, and, it came it came in, in later on, but the initial but was it's through... it's there a, now, an operating cost Yeah, well. but at the time of the initial construction, a lot of it was based upon voter referendum through their ad valorems and other taxation base. They voted it in. They wanted to have it, and they were willing to be taxed to pay for it. Mm. Mr. Now, Chairman, uh, may, I, may I put a bit in on this capital, too? Because I think I'm not <coughs> going to argue, but, I, but put the point to you. In the comparative analysis that we've done, we've used the capital costs that were developed by these gentlemen and that were developed by the phase three, and we've compared it against that. And that, incidentally, is all discounted against inflation. That, that point's always been thrown around. We haven't made up any of these figures ourselves. None of the four billion, eight billion figures are ours. We have said, and we'll say again, 
that when you start going underground as they plan there, there are risks, they are imponderables. Each study you do gets it a little more finite and what have you. And your government, we hope, will evaluate those risks. When it comes, however, to other questions like this, um, the earlier evaluations were, in fact, done on a benefit-cost calculation, which we said earlier, you know, is the standard methodology, and it comes out that way. Now, there were disputes about a number of those matters with regard to that particular system. The World Bank sent a team over here and said very clearly to your government, we think that the capital costs of the MRT system are underestimated by at least 30 percent and that the operating costs of the alternative bus system that you're comparing are overestimated by about 20 percent. Now, the World Bank then said, we think you ought to go bust because the benefit cost ratio and this comparison comes out quite negative in this regard. Now, since that dialogue went on, there has been, in fact, the phase three, which identified additional add-ons, modified things, and so on. So the capital costs increase. And I'm not talking about inflationary increases. You keep telling us there and there. And we're not talking about it. There is, a, there is a later year, but that's what we're comparing to. We're not comparing an earlier 75 bus against a 79 cost MRT or anything like that. My final point, sir, unlike the United States, where individual communities can get in effect, money given by their other citizens who never use their systems to help it. You have no fairy godfather father here in Singapore to give it to you. It's coming out of the pocket of every citizen. You ought to have the whole benefit of all the money you spend on transportation. And we've suggested by this report, you should look very hard and you should look at options. And if you feel that you can afford a much more elaborate system that has all these attributes that people like to speak, then you do that now and you do without something now. When you're richer in the future, and you will, and I'm sure you will be, you can afford a more elaborate system better too, remember. So well, those are the decisions you have to make. Subject Sorry, matter, please. I would like uh, Bruno and uh, Baltan just briefly. Okay, I like, to, on this. I like to respond first of all to the <coughs> comments about the World Bank's uh, critical assessment of the costs uh, both the construction costs and the bus operating costs. We have, since that time, a new cost estimate by totally different consultant group that has attempted to make a comparison between the original cost estimate, which was criticized as being too low, and their current cost estimate, 1979 prices. Now, in order to do that, they had to assume some rate of inflation in the construction industry because they were working with 1979 prices. They had assumed 7% for that inflation. Based on that assumption, they showed that the previous cost estimate was 20% too low. Now, we have gone back and checked what the inflation in the construction industry actually was compared to the assumption of 7%. We have found that the housing board experienced over that same period an inflation rate of 9.5%. At Changi International Airport, the inflation rate experienced for the same period was 11%. Now, if you plug in those 95 or 11% instead of the 7%, you would find that the previous cost estimate was very close to what the current cost estimate is, done by totally different consultants. That's the point on the construction. No, the I'm World sorry, Bank that was correct. also. There are add ons in that the, cost. The, and that's let the me finish, please. please. Okay. The uh, World Bank was also critical of the bus operating costs. Yes. Now, we've had an opportunity again uh, to compare what's actually happened to bus operating costs. I have gotten very detailed financial statements from Mr. Ma's bus company, and they show clearly that, that bus costs today are 24% higher in 1975 dollars than what we had estimated they would be for 1982. If we actually go back and, and correct for the income change, the, the salary increases that were built into the estimate, we find that the difference between our estimate then and what the costs are now expressed 
in those $75 is 27% more. Now, if the World Bank wants to continue to say that we underestimated the operating costs in light of actual experience, experienced by SPS, then, you know, that, that's, that's their yeah. uh, Maybe let's prerogative. Maybe let's hear what SPS experience. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I supplied those figures yes. to Bruno, so um, <clears throat> they are correct. But I don't want to go into this question of whether the costs are underestimated, overestimated, or what. I would just like to make this point. It is an accepted fact, I think, that the capital cost for the old bus system will be lower than the capital cost uh, for the underground. <coughs> but my question is this. Are we being told that we, can, we are actually paying more for the underground and getting the same kind of service that we would get if we were to pay less with an all bus. Are we being told that we are actually buying the same product but paying more on the one hand and paying less on the other? Or are we being told that you pay a little bit more, you get a better product, you pay a little bit less, you get a not so good product? I get the impression that we are being told that the all bus system is providing a comparable service in terms of speed, comfort and convenience to the MRT. So I think this is one point I would like to clarify. You know, the discussion on the, on the various costs, I think the, the question is put very fairly in this regard. And the decision as between those as to which you choose to pay in terms of what benefits you see, you're going to be assisted to a certain or to a considerable extent by what we call a formal cost-benefit evaluation of the type you've had. And you certainly have to do that once again, and it'll take a little time, but it doesn't take all that much time. The problem, though, is that we feel that you ought to, in effect, take another step to look at this alternative bus system. One of the most important things, we think, is to dispel this view that you're going up to the edge of a cliff and you're going to fall off. Now, just don't believe that about any, don't believe that if anybody tells you. You have enough ability, you have enough notice, you have enough ways to respond. If we were wrong, which we don't believe we are, about the principles of this bus system we've described here, and what it will do, and the fact that it will be equivalent in its fundamentals, and we're not going to argue whether the cushions are softer in an MRT versus a bus. That's a subjective matter, and you can argue endlessly on it. But the basic essentials of service, convenience, and reliability we think are achievable with all of these things working in combination. Now, then you have to choose what you're going to do, and you choose that in two contexts. One in terms of among these choices, and the other is in terms of what else you might spend on in Singapore that you would like to use that money for. And this is the essential test. But we've, we think that there is not this cataclysmic climate in which it must be done. If you do have to do some additional studies, it's to bring things up to date so you can do these calculations and get a clear choice and then look at the matters that are really related to the financing and what you want to pay. Look at the subjective matters that fundamentally make your choice uh, uh, you know, on the other aspects of this and then go ahead. But I think that the basic fact is that you have been under a number of wrong impressions, A, about what might happen in the future, B, about the limits of choice that you had. And if that's been illuminated by this discussion, we think we've performed at least that. We happen to think, in addition, that we're quite right about what we've said, and we put that to the test. It's public. It's there. <coughs> we stand on it. But would you like to Thank you. I don't know where the doomsday adjective slipped in <coughs> except in Ken's report. And I don't recall anyone having made such predictions in Singapore. Uh, also, uh, if we talk about the future, I think we should uh, also keep in mind the target year benchmark we're looking at is 92, which is about one decade away, slightly more. And the time to make decisions, we acknowledge. It, it, it doesn't have to be made yesterday. It could be made yesterday. It could be made today. It could be made tomorrow. 
One may ask, how long can I put off a decision? One may ask, what is the latest date we can start construction? Well, these questions can only be answered, in our opinion, by the Singapore officials and not by consultants. And I think that the officials, however, can be guided on some facts that help them to draw their conclusions, such as the facts on the level of public transport service that's available. The officials will obviously be aware, we certainly think they will, of just how much of the level of service deterioration that the commuter will be willing to put up with. Another fact is the congestion delays on the roadways faced by the commuters and the other users of these systems. And again, how much pressure there may be and how many views may be expressed. Furthermore, there should be some consideration to the types of jobs that will prevail in the expensive floor area of the central area. These highly skilled financial people, banking, insurance, business, commercial, highly skilled technical people working in the domestic and international markets, they'll be occupying these more and more. And what type of service will be required for them? Now, we have said before that the all bus system that we even proposed uh, would function. We didn't say it would work well. We said it would have high congestion cost, but it certainly could function. Now, uh, that is where we laid the line against which we compared the bus rail system. The beneficiaries, the total benefits were substantial in our opinion. We are tonight uh, facing a problem of choices, but before we uh, conclude, I'd like to ask whether the members of the panel will have and you would like to sum up the impression of the tonight's discussion, Milton? We have listened to experts for the last 12, 13 years. And we Singaporeans are different, I think. Uh, we have our own decision. We, we should not listen to Western ideas too much. They like the slow commuting method. We like fast. We like to go fast. That's why the drivers are always been asked, why do they cut from one lane to the other? They all want to go there faster. You cannot expect a chap that's working eight hours to want to go home one hour in a slow bus system. So to me, my mind is made up. I know what I want. I only hope my government and the rest of us will feel the same way. Well done. I want to make one point very clear. And that is that we are not saying that the all bus system won't work. We are saying that it can be made to work and that the cost of making it work is very high. And my view is that uh, the all bus system has been oversold as a comparable alternative but cheaper alternative to the MRT in terms of speed, comfort, convenience. Bill. Um, <clears throat> thank you. It does seem to me that if one can afford a system which is convenient and comfortable and would buy an MRT, which would at the same time enhance the growth of the central area because the MRT will bring people to the central area, it would therefore the central area would continue to grow at the same time, it does not provide the kind of immediate flexibility that a bus system would give you. The bus, term, the bus system can grow with the city. It could be flexible, to be made flexible, to bring people uh, to where the new centers may be. Uh, and therefore, it seems to me that if one wants to go with the growth of the city and let it grow by itself, then a more flexible system would be um, easier to implement. <clears throat> At the same time, if one wants to stick the city to grow in a very definite pattern, then the rail system would do that. Thank you, sir. I think my great regret is that this debate wasn't screened in 1976 or 75. <clears throat> I think if it had happened a bit earlier, there would have been more opportunities for all of us to look at this and discuss the issues. Because to me, the crux of the matter here isn't an MRT, isn't a bus. It's got to do with the quality of life. We are living in this country. In the long term, we stand to benefit or lose by it. And the question I'm asking is this. Whether it's 4 billion or 400 million, if it will make our quality of life better and we can afford it, should we not go, with, go ahead with it? 
We have a tonight discuss one major point, to my mind, which is really this issue of whether the city centre will tend to grow or will tend to reach a stage where it will wither and begin to slow down itself. I think the Hansel report gives the impression, if I'm not wrong, that there will be a certain point in time beyond which natural forces will tend to push people away from the city. We have a look at that. That's one of the critical areas. Perhaps we ought to think more about this, whether really, in terms of our planning, all our planning has stated that we will carry on mm. growing. And I think where the Hanson team has been very good is in bringing out this point for us to think about this again, whether we really should concentrate on that kind of planning. And perhaps if we do, and uh, we decide the MRT, maybe there'll be a lot more enhanced growth in the country. We may grow even faster. Or we say that maybe as a country, the 10% kind of rate of growth is not attainable after a point in time. At which time, then, maybe we can't justify these things anymore. So that's where it comes, the thinking. Thank you. Nanjang, well, can I add something? I share Tianse's uh, sentiments, but I am still disturbed by the high costs that uh, MRT would, would incur. However, being a chaotic kind of a person and chasing windmills all the time, I wonder if it's not possible for us somewhere along the line to have uh, a bus, cum re uh, not quite rail system, but in that matrix of choices that you had, can somewhere where we could have a light rapid transit system, call it what you will, I'm, I'm not sure what you call it, but it's enough to enhance one the quality of life, <coughs> albeit not at the optimal levels that my friend Tiensa would like, but at the same time, we can still uh, relieve the congestion and the headaches that uh, our engineers and our bus service will have. Joseph. Taika, uh, looking at the lower financial commitment that's required for an old bus system, and also looking at the network of expresses that we have for 1992, and two out of those six expressways will be completed by around the first quarter of next year. It may not be a bad idea to consider the Hanson's type of uh, express services on our newly acquired expressways on a pilot scheme from some of our towns. And uh, looking at the map too, there are two towns that strike me as potential candidates for such pilot schemes. Bedok is one of them. We have the East Coast Parkway, which will give you a very good capacity <coughs> road to the city. And we have Amo Kyo, which has caused uh, some traffic problems in the years before, before we got our road system sorted out in the Serangoon and Thompson Road corridor. We are also seriously designing the Sembawang and the Central Expressways, which will give a very good expressway link between Amo Kyo and the city. So Amo Kyo strikes me as another potential candidate for some form of pilot express services. Well, this was by us some time. Thank you, Joseph. Certainly, uh, not only the people of Singapore, but also the government will have a lot of decisions to make in the, year, in the, in the future, in the year, perhaps near future, maybe more time. One thing seems to be obvious to most of us here is that uh, there is no absolute argument for an old, bar, old bus system or a bus rail system. I think we agree that it is a question of what kind of quality of life, what kind of quality of pu public transportation that we're looking for. It is also quite evident to me that uh, Besides asking questions of value and judgment and our aspiration in the society and in the public transportation, we also have to go back and redo some of the calculation or do more calculation, maybe more engineering questions to answer, more computer to run before we can come to a final choice for Singapore. To make a plan of such a magnitude, for Singapore in the future. Not only that, it requires imagination and skill and expertise on the part of the government officials or consultants or the political leaders. I think it also requires sympathetic, creative thinking, imagination from the people of Singapore.
With that note, I thank you all for viewing this program.